There are very few people, uh, you look at the most successful people in the world, I, I know very few of them that haven't had a major failure. You know, if you read through the, um, they're not the financially most successful people, if you look, read through the Forbes billionaire list and you read their stories, you know, they've had failed businesses and they've lost everything and they've hung on the, you know, they almost died holding on to the ledge, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, the, K, the, uh, the guy on CBS and uh, oh, yeah. Sumner Fire, uh, yes. Sumner Redstone. The Redstone, yeah. Um, so there are lots of examples of people who had huge adversity. And I think it's how you deal with adversity that determines your ultimate success, as opposed to how you deal with success that determines your ultimate success. The investing business you can learn by reading. You know, read everything Warren Buffett's ever written, watch every YouTube video he's ever appeared in. Uh, that's a great way to learn uh, about investing. Uh, but inv investing is more than just, the, the way to really understand investing is to understand a business and one of the most important skills you need as an investor is dis distinguishing between a great business, a good business, a fair business and a bad business and one way to get a sense of the quality of a business is go to work for one. So the recommendation I give to people graduating from business schools these days is this is the greatest time in, in history to work for a startup. There are lots of incredibly interesting businesses being formed and if you can be one of the early employees you're going to learn a lot about how a business works, how to make payroll, how to market your product, how to design something and those skills I think are invaluable. First of all, you might even find it really interesting. You might have joined the next Facebook, so that's one thing. Even if the business fails, you'll learn a ton from that. I think that's the best experience you can get, ultimately, to be a good fundamental investor. How do you be a successful investor? Now, I'm assuming that you're not going to go into the business of investing. I'm assuming that you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You're going to pursue your passion. But you're going to have some money that you're going to save over time. And I'm going to give you my advice on the topic. It's not necessarily definitive advice, but it's what the advice I would give my sister my grandmother on what she should do if she were in the same position. I'd avoid investing in startup businesses um, where the prospects are not very well known. Because again, you don't need to make 100% a year to have a fortune. You just need to invest at an attractive return, 10, 15% over a long period of time, your money grows very significantly. So how do you avoid the riskiest investments? I would, my advice would be to invest in public securities, invest in listed companies, companies that trade on the stock market. Why? Because those businesses are, tend to be more established. They have to meet certain hurdles before they go public. The stocks are liquid, so you can change your mind if you want to sell. Investing is about the best investments are the ones where we are the confident we're right and everyone else is wrong. Yeah. Okay? And you have to, in order to be, you know, I've been accused uh, recently of being arrogant, among well, other things. No, no, I'm going to actually ask you that. It was called, <laughs> it was pompous, but that's okay. Pompous? I don't, I don't think I'm pompous, but I've certainly been accused of being arrogant. <laughs> And there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. Yeah. If you're arrogant in investing, you're going to get killed. Yeah. Right? If you're not confident, you'll never make an investment. Right? So you have to do a sufficient amount of work to be confident enough to have the conviction to do something that's contrarian. Right? We bought the stock of a, uh, of a soon-to-be-bankrupt retailer, I'm sorry, a shopping mall company during the financial crisis uh, at pennies per share. And you have to be willing to look silly when you yeah. do something like that. Uh, general growth stock's up 90-fold since our uh, original investment. Um, you know, on, that's, we had confidence. Maybe people thought it was arrogant to believe that yeah. we could be successful in turning it around. If you were an investor, what would you be? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would do what I do now, even if I weren't compensated uh, for doing it. Um, because I think it's a way for me to make the biggest contribution that I could make. I mean, I, I, look, I think about uh, government, if I could, if I could effectuate change the same way I can effectuate change in the, in the private sector. But I think I can have more influence as a private participant than a, than a public participant. And there's this guy uh, that I met, a uh, money manager named Bob Chapman, who uh, I met on a panel seven years ago. We were on a panel together, shook hands. I've never spoken to him since. I've never had an email correspondence. I've never seen him since. But in the last 90 days, he's been running the talk show circuit on how I'm, you know, uh, you know, either wrong or stupid or arrogant, uh, you know, giving quotes to Vanity Fair. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, I, I don't mind criticism, um, but I don't, I don't like reading things that are, I don't, you know, it, it's hard to read. For someone who doesn't know me well to be commenting on what I'm like right. as a person, I find, I find that difficult. Um, but, you know, whatever. I gotta, you have to have a thick skin to be in this business. Uh, and, um, you know, if you end up in a very public uh, uh, situation you should expect to have uh, fans and critics and mm -hmm. you know I just try to focus on you know what my job is and we focus on making money for our investors yeah. and I live my life I went to business school to learn how to be a good investor and I learned the first rule of investing which is you do your due diligence before you 
while you're in your, your money. And uh, when I got to HBS, I actually opened the course catalog for the first time, and there wasn't a class on investing. Now, there were classes on accounting, there were classes on finance. So I decided I had to develop my own little self-study program. And I wanted to, uh, so I, I opened a Fidelity brokerage account. I said this, I had some money I'd made in the real estate brokerage business. This was my tuition uh, in the investment business. And it was about a year of tuition. And if I lost it, it was as if I had gone to business school for two, you know, two years, but paid for three. So I, I figured it wasn't, it was like the, the inverse of the Oxford uh, one plus one program. But, um, and uh, you know, I, I, the first stock I bought went up. And I said, okay, I found what I want to do. <laughs> a little more involved than that, but I, I uh, actually, my father, who's here, he, he, he came with us. Uh, that's dad over there in the corner. Uh, you can ask him whatever questions you want afterwards. Um, he told me it was a really dumb idea to start an investment fund right out of business school. And he recommended that I go work for Michael Steinhardt or George Soros or one of the other famous investors at the time. But I figured that I knew enough. This is the, the, the perils of youth. Um, but uh, the answer is I was an entrepreneur, and uh, I felt that I wanted to approach investing my own way as opposed to uh, learn from someone else. And it's one of the few things you can really learn on your own. You can learn investing by reading books, by reading annual reports, by having a, you can have a portfolio and invest $100, and you can, and you can learn the business, uh, unlike many other businesses which require a lot more. So let's talk about, for a moment, um, some of the campaigns you've done as activists. Some of them have worked out, some have not. Uh, Chipotle has seemed to have worked out. But you did a couple that were difficult ones, or Herbalife or Valiant. Uh, they didn't work out. What would you say is the mistake you made in hindsight and that you would try to avoid in the future? Sure. So there's sort of eight principles that have driven our investment success. And when we have veered from those eight principles, uh, we've lost money. And uh, after the uh, 2000, we went through a very difficult period, circa 2015, 2016, the two investments you mentioned were big drivers of that. It was, uh, you know, if you will, experiences making mistakes and learning from them. And it was a moment of reflection for the firm. And I went back to the core principles that have driven our success for the first 12 years. And I had a member of the investment team literally engrave them in a stone tablet, not dissimilar from Moses' 10 commandments. And I had that stone tablet put in a, what you might call a deal toy, it sits on everyone's desk in the office. And uh, we've adhered to those principles you know, ever since. And you know, we've been fortunate uh, to return to you know, the success we had for the first uh, dozen years. So I think it's about keeping to, you know, our, our principles are basically, we want to invest in simple, predictable, free cash flow generative dominant companies with large barriers to entry that are in high returns on capital, that have limited exposure to extrinsic risk we can't control, strong balance sheets, don't need access to capital, to survive, have excellent management, good governance. Sounds logical, um, but you know, occasionally we've diverged, and there's uh, those times. You know, there's a certain discipline that comes with investments, and there always seems to be a countervailing quality that caused us to diverge. Uh, but in really, each case where we've compromised on business quality or complexity, we've been harmed. Not from the investment.